Welcome everybody to another episode of the Damage Report. I'm John Derola. This is Brett Ehrlich. Brett, welcome to the show. So you guys might wonder what are the last two words John says before the show begins. John, would you like to share with them the last two words? I you don't said? remember. What was it? Giant sloth. <laughs> John called me a giant <laughs> sloth. Not one minute ago. It was a metaphor for you killing my dreams. That was from the right, land of nightmares. That was directly after he called me the mayor of Nightmare Village. So welcome to the damage report. I like to brainstorm book concepts immediately before the show starts, <laughs> and he did not sign on enthusiastically and offer to co-write it with me. I, so I, be, I became a little bit emotional. I'm not going to lie to you. I literally have a book proposal drafted for you, yes. ready for you. Yes, which so we'll handle you it. did a great job on it, and it it looks really hard to write. So we will talk about that afterward. Um, there is a lot that we're going to talk about on the show that is not about sloths or Nightmare Village <laughs> or the current mayor of Nightmare Village. Lots of news. So uh, Andrew McKay back in the news. Apparently, they had a plan to try to get rid of Trump as president. Uh, how worried should we be about the precedent that was set there? Also, Paul Manafort, gigantic liar. Breaking news. We should have the thing up right here. Um, but he is a big liar. It's gonna be bad for him, and we're gonna break down exactly why he would have lied about the things that he lied about. We're gonna come up with some different theories and see which ones are most likely to be true. Near the end of the show, we are going to say goodbye to a, I guess a, that's not interstellar technically, but a, a solar explorer, a great figure in the history of exploration of our solar system. We are gonna bid that individual goodbye. Oh, Also, joining us on the show once again, one of our favorite guests, Varshini Prakash, of the Sunrise Movement, one of the co-founders and executive directors is gonna join us to talk about her experience at the State of the Union, talking to politicians about the Green New Deal, some of the pushback against the rollout of that plan and where she expects it to go from here. Also today, big announcement on the Sunrise Movement, what they're gonna be doing over the next couple of months. We'll talk about that as well. But first, we're gonna start off with very serious news. Today is the one year anniversary of the tragic shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas that killed 17 people, wounded 17 others, and began a movement that notched quite a few wins in terms of state level gun control laws concern for how terrible guns are. And we wanna look back on those who lost their lives in this shooting. Here you're gonna see a list of the names of the 17 different individuals. Also, uh, their age is listed there because although we probably don't need a reminder, um, many of these victims were very, very young. And of course, we live in the sort of country where this sort of violence, where people who are 13, 14, 15 years old, they lose their lives to gun violence completely unnecessarily on a daily basis. Um, I wish that we were capable of memorializing all of them. I wish that we lived in a country where we didn't need to have that problem. Um, but we are gonna look back on this particular shooting. It has been one year, Brett, it's really flown by. It really has flown by, but yeah, it, it, you always ask yourself on the anniversary of certain occasions, like does it feel like it was a full year, less than a year, more than a year? And in this situation, I guess my reaction is it feels like both. Mm -hmm. Feels like it was a long time ago in that I don't really know if I can point to any legislation that's been done in what seems like they've been, they've had a long time to accomplish it on a federal level. On a federal level, yes. Um, and it seems like just yesterday because when you think of where, I mean, I was here, I'm in the same workplace, and it doesn't feel like it's been a full year at the very same time. Yeah. What about you? Yeah, uh, so I, man, time really does fly. I mean, Donald Trump has been president for more than two years. How right. crazy is that? But like, I hear um, David Hogg is going to he's going to Harvard. You know, he's graduated. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. And and if you think back on all that they were able to accomplish, I mean, putting together a nationwide movement, rallies, marches, putting pressure on state level and federal lawmakers, um, I think dramatically and perhaps fundamentally changing the conversation about gun control, uh, elevating some of them to national figures. Um, it has been pretty amazing. Now, some of the, the, the figures you're seeing there in our B-roll, um, they are going dark on social media, perhaps understandably so. Um, while we tend to focus on what they have accomplished and what they have done coming out of this experience, we should also remember that the survivors have been hounded by attacks and conspiracy theories and 
you know, they've had to deal with so much in the year since the shooting actually happened. So it's understandable that some of them would like to take time off of social media where invariably they are attacked on a daily basis. But one one of the survivors, Cameron Kasky, did tweet out, today marks one year since the shooting at MSD. To the millions of people who watched the horror unfold from our home from their homes, thank you for caring, thank you for telling our story. Thank you for helping us show that Parkland is stronger than anyone who tries to ruin us. And I also saw a tweet from the president saying, in the years since their friends were killed, the students of Parkland refused to settle for the way things are and marched, organized, and pushed for the way things should be, helping pass meaningful new gun violence laws in states across the country. I'm proud of all of them. If you're listening to the podcast and that seems like not something Trump would say, it's because it's the last real president, Barack Obama. Yeah, um, today, I believe what Trump tweeted was funding bill for a second. Yes, two words, funding bill. Took it down mm -hmm. and then followed up with, uh, we're talking about the funding bill at the at White House. Yeah. Because I think he was searching for an explanation. What, what was happening with the funding bill in the public eye. I think to so. To see what he could react to. But yes, this is it. What strikes me a lot is just as more time passes, you really get a feeling for what, I mean, you can never have a feeling for what these people actually went through on the day of the shooting, but really just they have to continue to live with this in the aftermath of it. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously that never goes away for them personally. It is good to have anniversaries like this where we, I mean, it's not good that they exist in the first place, but it is worth on ad anniversaries like this just taking time to realize that these people are A, still gone, mm -hmm. the ones who died, and the people that were there around them are still living in the aftermath of it. And it is incumbent upon us to support, even if they do go dark on days like this and in, in for extended periods of time or whatnot, it is incumbent on us to keep that fight alive. Yeah, Just because we're not marching for the lives every day. We still have to look for opportunities to affect change. Yeah, or for every shooting. I know there will be some people who will be like, okay, well, there's a lot of tragic days like this. I mean, you could you could have anniversaries for any number of absolutely horrific mass shootings, just ones that have happened in the past couple of years. Not to mention the sort of regular everyday expected gun violence, some of which rises to the level of mass shootings that'll just happen one day. You know, four people will be shot in in a city or something like that. That happens because this is America. Um, I, I like to think that one of the reasons we memorialize this event is because we care about all of those. Mm -hmm. um, it will all, I mean, this is, sounds dumb to say, but it will always be on Valentine's Day yeah. for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Something that, I mean, even on the day they were ex exchanging Valentine's. Yeah. And that is supposed to be a symbol of love and hope and wholesome and, you know, making your life whole by loving someone. Mm -hmm. And, there will always be now uh, going forward a void in all of their lives. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. and I wonder. So I've I've had bad things happen to me. I've never had anything even approaching a percentage of this. I wonder in the past year, how many of them have had a day that they didn't think about it or have to think about it? None. Yeah, none of them. And then I mean, anyone who's been through a tragedy knows that. Like, if you have a full day where you didn't think about it, the next time you do think about it, you feel a little guilty. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think that within a year, that feeling would have gone away. Yeah. Now, I, I do want to also mention, uh, we sort of alluded to this earlier, some of what this uh, movement that was launched was able to accomplish in the past year. According to the Giffords Law Center, legislators on both sides of the, sides of the aisle in 26 states and Washington, D.C. enacted 67 new gun safety laws last year, some of those um, in Florida as well. But there is bad news too, because look, we know how the news cycle goes, we know how our consciousness goes. I mean, there are people completely lacking in empathy in this country. There are people who have tons of it, but even they, we are humans. And we were talking this morning about, doesn't it seem like Ralph Northam is kind of gonna be okay? That like, as, as, as passionate as everyone was, and we're gonna have a guest on next week to talk about it. Um, you can't pay attention to everything and people unfortunately do move on. And that is reflected in gun control as well. So a new NPR poll, found that 51% of Americans support stricter gun laws in the US. While that's a slim majority, it's a significant drop from when the same poll was conducted last year soon after the Parkland shooting, when 71% of Americans said gun laws should be tightened. A 1990 Gallup poll found that 78% of Americans wanted increased gun restrictions. That was literally decades ago. Now, 42% say that stricter gun legislation should be an immediate priority for Congress. Last April, that was at 52%. 
Yeah. And so while you have particular issues that people are unambiguous on, Ro Khanna tweeted this out, 84% want expanded background checks, 70% wanted a bump stocks ban, 58% want an assault weapons ban. In general, in terms of it being a priority, despite the best efforts, a generational push, people start to move on. And and not because we're safer, not because we dealt with the problem, just because time has passed. And I do wanna say if other things that are equally like jarring to look at in data and numbers and like uh, firsthand sources. Jonathan Larson from TYT Investigates, you should really check out his Twitter because he has an amazing uh, look at a memo, an internal memo from Smith & Wesson where they are very dispassionate in their appraisal of what this has done to their investig- to their reputation because they are the ones that made the rifle that was used during the Stoneman Douglas um, shooting. Things like Smith & Wesson visibly within violent crime reporting, uh, their visibility remains small in that reporting. So they don't think that their reputation really has been hurt. And things like, you know, it's not worth addressing this problem, um, uh, our, our reputation among people that wouldn't buy our guns anyway. Yeah. We're still motivated by profit and we would take a hit uh, from the Second Amendment community. So we're just going to lay low and wait till it passes and it looks like it has. Yeah. We are gonna take a break. When we come back, lots more news to get to, including the latest on Paul Manafort and Andrew McCabe after this. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it, the New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. Okay, we worked it out over the last break. He's no longer mayor of Nightmare Village, and I think we're going to be writing a book together soon. Okay, <laughs> with that, why don't we jump Happy back? Happy Valentine's and... Day, John. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. By the way, Happy Valentine's Day, Arlene, as well. Oh, gross! Out to you especially. What is my? She's wife's probably not listening name? anyway. Oh, good, good afternoon. But regardless, wife. Okay. I remembered my wedding ring today. I am a romantic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, with that, why don't we jump in the news? Actually, before we jump back in the news, uh, if you have not written yet a review on iTunes for the podcast, for the damage report, you are missing out because at the end of the show, I'm gonna read a couple. It could be yours. We could do that as long as it's not profane. We could do that. So just write one of those, give it a five star review, and uh, we will do that for you. With that, we jump back into the news. Andrew McCabe back in the news to Donald Trump's chagrin, perhaps, uh, revealing some of what was going on behind the scenes in the Department of Justice with concerns about Donald Trump in the immediate aftermath of his firing of James Comey. So we're gonna get more details on this on Sunday. This is sort of a preview for the 60 Minutes interview that's gonna happen. But Andrew McCabe, former deputy FBI director who was fired last March, told 60 Minutes in an interview uh, on Thursday, that uh, this portion of it, um, that Justice Department officials talked about invoking the 25th Amendment to remove President Donald Trump. Those deliberations came in the days following Trump's sudden firing of James Comey in May of 2017. If you are not following the Constitution as closely as Andrew Piquet perhaps, section four of the 25th Amendment of the Constitution states that if the Vice President and a majority of cabinet secretaries decide the President is quote, unable to discharge the powers and duties of the presidency, they can start a process that could remove him from office. It has never been invoked and I mean, they were talking about it. It seems 
inconceivable that Mike Pence and a majority of the people that Donald Trump had picked for the cabinet would do this. It is hypothetically a thing that could happen. It is being treated by Donald Trump and his supporters of the media right now like they were on the verge of a coup. But but were they really? I think this is marginally more like a coup than my tweet asking him to reside earlier this week. I think they're on roughly the same playing field in terms of how likely they were to cause him to vacate the office. It doesn't make sense unless there was an enormous public outcry among the base. There's no reason that Mike Pence would would ever support anything like this because it's conceivably he might become president in the wake of that. That would be one advantage. You'd be president of the ashes. Exactly, yes. Yeah, people, people always miss something. They talk about, well, if you get rid of Trump, you get Pence. Yeah, but not like in the best of times. He'll be succeeding a president who was pulled out of office. That is not a position that you govern with from a great deal of authority and power. Right. But uh, anyway, that's a side note. Yeah. So, uh, Andrew McCabe. Go for it. No, I'm oh, Andrew McCabe. Andrew McCabe? I, I like reading it. I like reading <laughs> okay. all this stuff. This is like the fantasy fake, like kind of, this is fantasy news. Mm hmm. I love the idea of this. I, for me, I like to reside in this part of my mind where I believe that it is constant chaos in the White House. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know how this knowing it's constant chaos in the, in the White House, and even if, it, if it's borne out that everything Andrew McCabe is saying is absolutely true, like how it materially affects the experience of being an American mm-hmm. and how the, there will be a different policy arc if everyone's like, you know what, he's right. I think that the denials will continue. I just don't think that, um, I mean, obviously he wasn't able to be successful in in whatever attempt there may have been to oust the president mm-hmm. from the White House. Um, Which I think even referring to it as an attempt is going very far. So there, there was a talk, what does that, I mean, was that talks or was that literally Andrew McCabe and one to three other people in a room who once discussed it? And then probably into that conversation with, that, that would never work, right? And that's the thing is like uh, they talk about like before you get on a flight, they're checking to see if the flight will crash. So technically, there are thoughts about the plane crashing mm-hmm. before every single flight. Does that mean that they were trying to crash the the plane? And and one thing that is shocking about this is like. Those are the kinds of things you want people who know about the law, procedure, and history to be familiar with yeah. and to continue to check in on. That, that in, in, in a previous time, would be called due diligence. Mm-hmm. And now it is what? It's like Pulp Fiction. It's a coup. Yeah. yeah, it's a coup. It's this crazy Banana Republic stuff. But it should remind, like, that probably doesn't happen a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, now it's just part of the constant chaos. But at the time, it was shocking, and that reaction that they had to those circumstances does reflect the chaos I felt about America in those moments. Yeah, so apparently they, they were similar to other Americans in that respect. Yeah. A uh, few more details, McCabe also admitted he opened an obstruction of justice probe into Trump after Comey's firings and took steps to ensure it would survive uh, him should he be fired from the FBI. I know there there are going to be some people who are going to go to their grave thinking obstruction of justice from Trump. How could you say that? I mean, check his Twitter feed. Like, if you know what obstruction of justice is, if you know how a president can exert influence over investigations, like, there's tons of stuff that hypothetically could be found to have happened in the shadows. But we know what happened in the spotlight. And in the spotlight was witness tampering multiple times and other forms of obstruction of justice. I'm I'm done having that conversation about whether it happened. Right, and what what you're saying is absolutely right. It is just the brashness that somehow masks it. Mm -hmm. The brashness, the ability to stand, like do that in such a public arena, you would assume that things like witness tampering, things like intimidation, things like obstruction of justice would be like, let's look back into the history of America and find out the last time that happened. There were like tapes yeah. of record made by recording devices embedded in the walls of the White House. Yeah, and we had and there was there were flashlights at night of people sneaking into the Watergate Hotel. Like that's obstruction of justice. It's not like, hey, Michael Cohen, you want to testify? Well, your father-in-law better watch the hell out. Yeah, like yeah. that is. Or hey, you people who are cooperating with the Department of Justice, if you don't, you might get a pardon. Right, like those those things are very public obstructions of justice. Yeah, 
And and it's just so weird. And that's that's the crazy pills I feel like I'm taking. And that must be the crazy pills that it felt like Andrew Andrew McCabe at the time must have felt like he was taking. Yeah. Just being like, this is this is happening. I guess we should have a meeting. Like yeah. we wouldn't expect this to happen, but yeah, I guess I that's the next step. We should look at the law. Yeah. And uh, Trump's attacking him, but Trump is asserting that he said things that he didn't. Right wing media is, they, they could argue with what Andrew McCabe is saying happened, but they're not. They're arguing with all sorts of things that he isn't saying happened. Um, in any event, The Atlantic has a full write up from Andrew McCabe. You can read that. Understand they include details, all of this reporting does. People will pretend that it doesn't, but it does, as to why Andrew McCabe might in some ways be biased against Donald Trump. If you think that that's a significant factor, that is something that you can look into, obviously. Um, but the idea that you know they were they were thinking about these things to me does not seem that bizarre and certainly does not rise to the level of a coup. Mm-hmm. In any event, why don't we move on to other news? A judge has ruled that Paul Manafort has lied about even more than the things that we thought that he had lied about. The way that this process works is you start cooperating with the special counsel because they found out that you lied about a bunch of things. And as part of that deal, you have to assert that I have now revealed all of the stuff I lied to you guys about. Well, it turns out that he didn't do that. He had been concealing even more lies, lies that are concerning when you begin to speculate as to why exactly he would have not told the truth about these particular things and why not just he would lie, but he would lie with the penalty of significant additional time in prison. So Paul Manafort, he is facing significant penalties already prior to today. But with this new information, it is not impossible that he could spend the rest of his life in prison. He has many, many lawyers. He would know that before concealing additional lies. So we have to ask ourselves, why would you risk spending years or decades more in jail to continue to lie about things that we're already sort of suspecting and inspecting as well? But he did do it, so let's talk about the nature of that lie. The court found that Manafort lied about his contacts with Konstantin Kalimnik both during and after the election. Manafort was also found to have lied about, quote, a payment that was routed through a pro-Trump political action committee to cover his legal bills and about information relevant to another undisclosed investigation underway at the Justice Department. A reminder that there are many investigations we know about, there are some that we don't necessarily know about. And let's talk about some of the nature of the communications between these two individuals. The Post had previously reported that Back in August 2nd, 2016, there was a meeting at the Grand Havana Room, a private cigar, that sounds nice, a private cigar room in New York. Uh, Manafort, Deputy Campaign Chairman Rick Gates and Klimnik discussed, quote, a proposed resolution to the conflict over Ukraine, an issue of great interest to the Russian government, according to a partially redacted transcript of the February 4th hearing. It was there that they may have been, quote, a handoff by Manafort of internal polling data from Trump's presidential campaign to his Russian associate. So look, there are gaps there that need to be filled in. But it's not crazy pants to speculate that perhaps Russian interests lied with a particular resolution of a conflict in that region. It looks like Manafort might have been reassuring this person with connections with that government that, hey, internal polling is showing that we might have a chance at this thing. He is willing to lie about that again at the risk of additional years or decades in prison. Why? Well, not lying about it would alienate a president who could pardon him. That's a good point. That's really the only point that I've seen coming out of this that makes any sense. But why would he think that the president would be willing to interfere in an investigation like this and give a pardon to protect himself? But it wouldn't be in the investigation. Now it's a time, it's a waiting game to see what happens first, like the Mm -hmm. uh, conviction and sentencing or the end of the Trump presidency. And as we get closer to the end, potential end of the Trump presidency, that's what Manafort is. But Manafort's already in for a lot of jail time. Mm -hmm. He uh, was just like, I will lie, I will tell as few truths as I can get away with and as many lies as still still covers my butt on this. Yeah, yeah, perhaps. And uh, so, look, as of right now, I've already seen on Fox News today, they're talking about, well, you know, he's he's really old, like ah, facing that much jail, shouldn't they just pardon him? No. Okay, well, look, they're gonna say it, obviously. And understand the timeline that we're talking about. Again, some gaps need to be filled in, but the timeline we're talking about. When he supposedly hands over this polling data to this person with connections to the Russian government, this is after it had been reported that Russia was seeking to interfere in the election. So after that, they're giving internal polling data to this person in connection with the possible resolution of a foreign policy conflict. Understand also in the background, 
in the last week or so, there has been sort of media conversations about a future conflict in Ukraine. And speculation, this is not from Russian government officials, this is from the sort of media figures in the country that, well, you know, it's probably not that risky to get involved once again, because it's likely that Trump is gonna say, well, you know, big picture, we still wanna be on the side of Russia. And I'm not saying in terms of like collusion or anything, I'm saying in terms of international alliances. So they are factoring in Trump is probably not gonna care about whether we invade another portion of Eastern Europe, because we know where his loyalties lie in terms of you know, geopolitics. I'm so that's a fun me. position to be in. In any event, we are gonna take a break, uh, a little bit more foreign policy in a different region of the country after this. Very good news update on Yemen. Uh, the House resolution to uh, withdraw US support for that conflict has finally passed. I feel like we have been talking about it with Ro Khanna for the last six months or so. And uh, he got very close uh, just a couple of months ago back when the Republicans controlled the House. But as of yesterday, it has passed this rebuke of Donald Trump and his approach to Yemen vis-a-vis -vis Saudi Arabia. Now, there is very good reason to believe that the Senate will pass the same resolution in the very near future. Back in December, they passed a parallel resolution to the House version, and it received a vote of 56 to 41. So it appears that this will end up on the president's desk. But it is an open question as to whether Donald Trump will issue his first veto of his presidency over continuing support for the war on Yemen. It what do you think? So, it's such a weird, like if you look at the history of this vote, from, from my research, it's, it wasn't even like they were able to vote in the House, just be, in the previous House before the Democratic takeover, because the leadership blocked it. Now, it bears saying the Senate is the hard one to get. They had gotten the Senate. Mm -hmm. 56 senators voted in a Congress that was that is was was more divided than that along party lines. So that is technically a bipartisan resolution to get us out of Yemen. And it what and the House of Representatives is the House of the People. It is the people's house and it should reflect the people. It's based on population, and that's how it breaks down. For the leadership to step in and have said, ah, we're not even gonna vote on it. That is that should make you so mad mm -hmm. at the utter breakdown of what should be. that The design of that legislative body is such that it should ensure that weird rules like the filibuster do not affect what happens there. And in this, this situation, that is exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. That is, and, and the popular, I mean, people don't support the war in Yemen. The, the, def, the biggest the camouflage that everyone has in, in that wants the war to continue is that people just don't know or understand yeah. it or can follow it. Yeah. But it is, it is, there are lots of proxy wars out there based on like our relationship with other countries, how that's going, is it good, is it bad? But Yemen is one where it is very explicitly like, do we like the Iranians or do we like the Saudis? Mm -hmm. And the Saudis have done things that should make us not like them. Uh -huh. But we have done things that should make a lot of people not like us. But in this situation, for, for the president's influence, and it seems like his buddy-buddy relationship with Mohammed bin Salman, um, it seems very personal. Yeah, it does. Um, despite all the Khashoggi stuff. Yeah, uh, I think you're 100% right. I do think that that's the calculus that people make. I wish that more of the calculus was on, not on Saudi Arabia or on Iran, but on Yemen, because they are the people that are actually suffering. Um, and I agree, it's extremely frustrating that these sorts of conflicts can continue to receive US support, not based on people supporting the war, even supporting the war for terrible reasons or because they've been deceived, but because they don't know and don't care. And that is frustrating, and that is why we, over the past year plus, have talked about it and talked about it and talked about it, despite the fact that even though we're doing our best uh, attempt to educate people on the topic, those videos never have and never will get any views whatsoever. <laughs> it's very true. But that's all we can do at this point. So thank and you to the few thousands of people that clicked. Thank you to the 2,000 people that watch this video, and thank you to Ro Khanna and the many others in the House. And I'm not gonna go through the whole list, I know Chris Murphy's been great on this, um, who have done that. In the media, thank you to Chris Hayes, who has talked a lot about Yemen, and that's basically it. Every once in a while it gets talked about somewhere else, but that's basically it. Uh, now. I wanna mention one other thing, in terms of that human cost, uh, the war in Yemen has killed an estimated 50,000 people, according to one independent estimate, and has left more than 20 million Yemenis in need of humanitarian assistance. We we're talking about uh, possible starvation for a huge number of people, cholera outbreaks, other diseases. 
The resources to stop this are available hypothetically, but have been stopped from being distributed because of Saudi Arabia. The, the individual that you're seeing there is a 12 year old, Fatima Koba. She is a 12 year old and she was weighed and weighs 10 kilograms. We don't, we don't use the metric system here, but I can assure you that that is not a weight that any individual at 12 years or even far younger should weigh. It's 22 that, pounds. 22 pounds for a 12 year old girl. That is what has been wrought by this war. That is what we are still as a country supporting. Maybe we've pulled it back a little bit from the aerial refueling or whatever, but they still want to engage in this war without ever looking at someone like Fatima, thinking about someone like Fatima, let alone the many, many others who've been put in this situation because of this completely needless and horribly barbaric war. So again, thank you to all those who've been pushing for this. I hope to see it resolved in the Senate very soon too. And you know what, if he wants to veto it, make him veto it and put pressure on him to hopefully stop that from happening. With that, we are gonna take a break. We come back, Varshini Prakash of the Sunrise Movement is gonna be joining us to break down the latest on the Green New Deal after this. Joining us once again to break down the latest on the Green New Deal, Varshini Prakash, Executive Director and Co-Founder of the Sunrise Movement. Varshini, welcome to the show. Hey John, it's good to be here, thanks for having me. Good to have you here, and so I consider you a friend of the show, but I do have to start off by asking you the tough questions. And so I read the proposal for the Green New Deal that was released last week, and there was some good stuff in it. But I am curious why environmentalists like you want to ban cars and planes and cows, I don't mm. understand that. Thank you for the tough questions, John. Really appreciate you asking the stuff that matters the most to Americans right now. Mm -hmm. No, but for real, okay, let's clarify right at the beginning. None of that is in the resolution for a Green New Deal. The resolution says nothing about banning air travel or cows or any of that garbage that is being put out in this rumor vortex um, that Mitch McConnell and Trump are trying to do to ultimately just distract from what is actually in the resolution. And what the Green New Deal is calling for is a massive 10 year economic mobilization to transform every part of our economy and society to stop the climate crisis and create millions of good jobs for people in this country. Let's set that record straight. The reason why the rumors are flying is because the Republicans are scared. They have seen the amount of momentum that's come out the gate. There are already 85 plus co-sponsors on the Democratic House side. 12 co-sponsors on the Senate side of the resolution that launched seven days ago now. And they are freaking out because this is a plan to tackle both the crisis of wealth inequality and economic stagnation that has hit America as well as the climate crisis and they have nothing to, to respond with. And it, it might be that someday they will switch to a sort of substantive response to the Green New Deal, but I don't expect that anytime soon. Um, so I, I want to, I'm not gonna try to persuade people who believe that you're trying to stop cows from farting. But for those who are, who are curious about the nature of the Green New Deal, the way this conversation is gonna play out over the next few years. I mean, obviously one important characteristic of the Green New Deal is that it is not just a list of subsidies for renewable energy, caps on carbon. It goes beyond things that are explicitly environmental in an obvious fashion. Um, why is it that you believe that things that are not explicitly environmental are have to be a part of the Green New Deal for it to accomplish its goals. Absolutely, I mean, the Green New Deal, the climate crisis really touches every single aspect of our lives, right? We cannot move um, to stop renewal, uh, to stop climate change. We cannot avert crisis without actually tackling um, uh, the fact that we need to, that it's gonna require a massive labor force, that we're gonna actually need to employ millions of people in good high paying jobs in order to carry out this work, that we're gonna need to build out and invest in massive technologies. What we're really discussing here is a massive investment in America, a reestablishment of a social contract that has been lost and destroyed and damaged over the last 40 years. And we uh, cannot be talking about things 
like existential threat to humanity without talking about the way that the fossil fuel industry is already impacting communities of color and people on the front lines of crisis. People in Flint, Michigan who um, have their water poisoned with lead or people in indigenous communities and farmers and ranchers who are seeing their land being taken away um, to make way for pipelines and things like that. Or for our generation, uh, which is gonna be if we don't take action immediately in the next few years, is gonna be throwing us into a future of chaos and disarray. So it looks like we might actually end up seeing a vote on the Green New Deal earlier than expected because Mitch McConnell thinks that he can embarrass Democratic senators by getting them on the record about the Green New Deal. Are you scared? We're not scared at all. Look, bring it. We know that the vast majority of Americans actually support these kinds of policies. And Mitch McConnell thinks that by pulling a political stunt like this, and that is literally what it is, it is just a political stunt um, that he thinks that he can win in 2019. But what he's really doing is setting himself up to fail in 2020. There are over 80% of Americans who support a Green New Deal right now. That is like over 90% of Democrats and almost 65% of Republicans like his own base. He has nothing to deliver them and all he actually has the power to do right now is try to torpedo any kind of major program um, or policy that seeks to improve everyday Americans lives. Um, whether that go from the climate crisis to jobs programs or to ensuring that people have access to uh, health insurance and health care. Um, and he has nothing to offer the American people. So we're putting forward a bold vision for American society that's supported by people of both political parties. And we think that this is gonna make it pretty hard for him um, in the 2020 elections. So speaking of the 2020 elections, obviously we're already in the beginnings of the Democratic primary and virtually every one of the declared candidates on the Senate side, most of the others have said that they support the Green New Deal. Not everyone has signed on, but most have. And so I'm, I'm curious if we're, if we're keeping it real, they have said that they support the Green New Deal. You have, you have spoken with some of the, these people. Do you believe that they support a Green New Deal of some kind or do they support the Green New Deal that you and I have been talking about in its substance and scope? Yeah, this is gonna be the defining question on this issue for the next two years. And we have seen, as you said, virtually every major presidential contender on the on the Democratic side come out in favor of a Green New Deal. I'm not holding my breath for Howard Schultz and I don't think anybody else should too. <laughs> But look, we're gonna have to be asking these politicians very concretely, do they actually support some of the core elements of the Green New Deal? Do they support a job guarantee that ensures that every American in this country has access um, to a good job and a, a, a living wage? We're gonna have to be asking every single one of them, do they actually center racial and economic equity as a core component of the Green New Deal? Are they actually talking about a 10 year massive economic mobilization in the ways that we are. So this has become sort of a litmus test already for 2020 candidates. And now we're gonna drill down into the details um, and ensure that they're all actually um, uh, embracing not just the, the, the lip, not paying lip service and not just embracing the buzzwords, but are actually talking concretely about the specific things laid out in Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Senator Markey's um, resolution, which I actually think presents us with a solid high watermark for uh, a Green New Deal. I hope so, and I, and I hope that there is not a debate that goes by in the cycle that does not have multiple questions about this topic, hopefully. Uh, but I know how that's worked out historically in terms of climate change. <laughs> Well, we're um, gonna be there pushing for it every single step of the I way. Hope so. So. Uh, so talking of being there, I ask you this purely as a politics nerd, but uh, because of your role in developing this conversation, pushing the Green New Deal, uh, you recently attended the State of the Union. Could you tell us a little bit about I that experience? Did. I did, yeah, it was a huge honor. So Senator Markey, I'm, I'm from um, outside of Boston, lived in Massachusetts my whole life. So Senator Markey was excited to have a fellow Massachusetts person um, who was also a huge climate change advocate and activist with him at the State of the Union as his special guest um, a little over a week ago. And it was a huge honor and also pretty thrilling to see the way that um, mainstream politicians have uh, recognized and become really excited and are following the energy and passion of young people and are in good faith um, 
putting forward measures and policies and visions for America that are in line with what young people are calling for. So it kind of um, cemented that, I think, in a big way. And um, it was pretty surreal. Like, I, I don't know. I kind of thought Donald Trump was maybe just like this figure in my TV or like a hologram <laughs> or something, but he is real. Um, and it was, I don't know, it was wild to see that. Um, and also to be sitting alongside um, a person to my left who was the father of a young boy who had been murdered um, in an act of gun violence. And to my right, a um, man who was working to uh, support communities in Ohio who are suffering from the opioid epidemic and, and wow. decriminalizing drug addiction. And um, to see the way that Donald Trump failed to articulate any kind of vision for America that actually um, um, you know, address the issues that so many of us are facing right now. And of course, he didn't mention climate change once, yeah. uh, which I wasn't surprised by, um, but just shows us how much work is cut out ahead of us. Yeah, I think the closest he came was uh, was cheering for our energy exports, which is sort of missing <laughs> yes. the point a little bit. Um, but yeah, I do have to say I'm extremely jealous, not only of your presence at the State of the Union, but your presence at the center of this continuing conversation. And thank you for all the work that you and your organization do. We really do yeah, appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Look forward to being back. Anytime, uh, hopefully we'll talk to you soon. We are gonna take a short break though. When we come back, we uh, say goodbye to a, uh, what, what do we agree on? A Just a oh. solar explorer. Yeah, we also say history. goodbye to half of our monitor. There is severe weather in Los Angeles there right is. now against all odds. So uh, yes. apologies for that. Exactly, so more after this. This week, we unfortunately have to say goodbye to an explorer, the Opportunity Rover on Mars, who for 15 years has been just roving around and taking pictures. He's like any young European, basically. <laughs> um, but he has been doing so under extraordinary conditions. And uh, unfortunately, it looks like his mission has come to an end. Sorry, his or her mission has come to an end. Um, for more than a decade, Opportunity has been an icon in the field of planetary exploration. This is coming to us from the Associate Minister for NASA's Science Mission Directorate, teaching us about Mars' ancient past as a wet, potentially habitable planet and revealing uncharted Martian landscapes. Whatever loss we feel now must be tempered with the knowledge that the legacy of opportunity continues, both on the surface of Mars with the Curiosity rover and InSight lander, and in the clean rooms of JPL where the upcoming Mars 2020 rover is taking shape. Uh, opportunity explored for 5,352 Martian days, 60 times longer than it was expected it would be able to do that. And we've got some some of the photos that were taken. We can't go through all of the photos Opportunity sent back because it sent 217,000 photos. But there you're seeing its initial sort of shell that it descended in before it bounced along the surface of Mars. We've got a very close up photo. That is a photo of tiny little Martian rocks. So I love Martian rocks. It's 1.2 inches across, magnified. Those are just little rocks on Mars that we can see as clearly as any other. How awesome is that? Like, and this was a camera that was Look built that. before 15 years ago. Like it exactly. got there 15 years ago. It takes what, like nine months to get to Mars? At least, yeah. Um, and that's, I just made that up, but no, no, I, I, that's always what I hear is nine months. So, but. oh God, good job, wow. Henry. But uh, wow, great B-roll, like Sophie. The, the photo, the photos are amazing. They, they digitized, what camera did you have 15 yeah. years ago that could take Wait, uh, that many know, megapixels you, you, you in it? Keep going with that, that's awesome. Let's that's see all more we that. had, that's, <laughs> that's all awesome. it is, that's that's the B-roll. I should. wanna see it again. All right, John wants to see yeah. it again. Jeez. No, that's awesome. We, I know that we, we've talked about the other rovers and everything, and I'm already trying to get somebody on to talk about the 2020 Mars rover. We sent a car to another planet, everybody. We're capable of amazing things. Stop thinking so small, humanity. What? We sent a car to take pictures on another planet, and it did it. It took selfies even. It did it even though this is an absurdly dry, absurdly cold, radiation blasted wasteland. It rode around for years <laughs> taking photos. It's being blasted by sand and dust storms on a constant basis that we're expected to corrode and wear it away in just a few months. Instead, it has lasted and lasted and lasted. It is an amazing testament to what humanity is capable of doing when we believe and we put some resources into it. And yes, I know it can be a little bit difficult to take these photos and say exactly how this is gonna benefit an individual human in an individual circumstance. But the scientific drive that leads to things like the Opportunity Rover is why we have all the amazing things that we have as a species. How do you really feel, John? That's how I feel. 
I love oh. this little rover, and I hope that someday we're able to recover it. It's Valentine's Day. It should Day. be in a, a, a museum someday. It belongs in a museum. <laughs> I was just thinking that. Uh, it does, though. It belongs in a museum. Well, John, the next car that goes there can bring it back. And hopefully, put it hopefully. In a Okay, we don't have any more time, unfortunately. A little bit of good news to close out. Um, the proposed Amazon headquarters in New York is uh, being canceled because everybody hated the idea. <laughs> um, and thankfully, there was this. So there's this campaign uh, led by both individuals in New York. No, Mickey Counts was very uh, vocal about it. Uh, AOC was very vocal about it at the national level, and people spoke out and sustained it for months. And now it's not going to happen. And there were some good benefits, but there's also a lot of concern about how much money was being given to them. Some of the effects it would have had on housing prices, a number of other issues. More on it on the main show later today on TYT exactly. Network. Brett, thank you so much. Great to be here. You're the Happy best. You're hour. the best giant sloth I know. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Night. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.